I wouldn't labor you with this. Thank you all for allowing us to have the pause there as we uh, do votes. I think the next series of votes is around 5.30, so we'll be halfway done at that point, right? <laughs> Pursuant to committee rules, uh, all witnesses do need to be sworn in before they testify. So as I call us back in order, if you please stand and raise your right hands. If you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Let the record reflect all witnesses answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, I would ask you to limit your testimony to around five minutes. I think most of you have been around this before. Uh, Mr. Grants are obviously just a few hours ago on this, so you will see a clock in front of you to give you a quick time down, uh, countdown, uh, if you just be as close to that as you possibly can on that. Ms. Roddenberry, you can begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Mem Member Connolly and members of the committee. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk to you about State regulatory programs for hydraulic fracturing. I am the oil and gas director in the State of Oklahoma. I am the director of the Oil and Gas Conservation Division of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. We are the agency that regulates oil and gas drilling and production operations in the State of Oklahoma. I am also here talking today as a uh, member of the Board of Stronger. I am currently serving as chairman of that board. And I am a member of the uh, Board of the Groundwater Protection Council as well. So I am going to talk a little bit about a couple of the um, programs that those organizations um, have underway that are addressing hydraulic fracturing issues. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize, though, how important it is for everybody to understand that states do regulate hydraulic fracturing. Um, just how they go about regulating hydraulic fracturing is documented in the stronger reports that I will describe in a little more detail shortly. Um, but those, uh, those programs that the states administer have been around for many years. They are comprehensive. Uh, they are continually improving. And I think you can summarize them by saying they are strong, they are responsive, they are flexible, and they are adaptive. And for all of those reasons, I believe they are effective in ensuring that hydraulic fracturing operations are conducted safely. Now, the states do face challenges. Um, many of those challenges are associated with the development of new technologies, the, the use of hydraulic fracturing in different places and in different ways um, than it's been used in the past. Um, so there, there uh, is no doubt that there are issues associated with hydraulic fracturing uh, in today's environment. I will say the nature of those challenges varies from state to state. Um, I can also say that states are acting to address those issues in a way that is uh, fitting to their specific circumstances. I will just give you an example for Oklahoma. Uh, in Oklahoma, the ramp up in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing uh, activity uh, in Oklahoma within the last decade occurred during a period of severe drought. And so we did face um, some serious issues about the sources of water for hydraulic fracturing operations. We also um, needed to do what we could to encourage recycling of, of the flowback waters from hydraulic fracturing operations to, de to uh, minimize the demand on our freshwater resources. Uh, for that reason, we had to take another look at our regulations for the management of produced waters. Uh, in oil and gas operations. For many years, we had prohibited, basically, pits that were used to store produced waters. Though those had been phased out decades ago. But now we were in a situation where we needed to accommodate the temporary storage of flowback waters in pits so that that water could be used in, in future hydraulic fracturing operations and we could save our freshwater resources. Uh, to address the issue, uh, the Corporation Commission worked with the industry and other interested parties to develop new rules for the, the large pits that were used to store flowback waters on a temporary basis so that they could be uh, reused and recycled. There are more examples from other states about how, what issues they have faced and how they uh, have addressed those issues in the Stronger reports. I will just refer you to those. Uh, Stronger is, uh, as the Chairman said, a stakeholder process. Uh, the Board of Stronger, all of the guidelines development work groups, all of the review teams that Stronger puts together are stakeholder uh, bodies that include representatives of, of state regulatory programs, industry, and environmental organizations. 
In the last few years, Stronger has developed guidelines for state hydraulic fracturing regulations and has conducted reviews of state hydraulic fracturing programs. Uh, we have done these reviews in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Colorado, and Arkansas, and we are we're open to doing reviews in other states as they volunteer. What the guidelines um, and the reviews do is help the states benchmark their regulatory programs and identify areas for improvement. Um, and the process works. Uh, if, if you look back over the history of Stronger, Stronger does do follow-up reviews to see how states have responded to the recommendations they make. And over time, when, when Stronger has done follow-up reviews, we have seen that fully 75 percent of the recommendations have already been met at the time of the follow-up reviews, and, and others were in process. So the states do take these reviews seriously. In Oklahoma, for instance, we've already, um, we did receive some recommendations which, which were welcome to us about how we could um, strengthen our program um, under the hydraulic fracturing guidelines that Stronger put together. We've amended a couple of our rules. We've also worked with uh, our legislature and our governor to address some of the funding and staffing issues that arose in recent years, especially during the, the budget crisis we've all been struggling through. So we have taken those, those recommendations from the Stronger Review seriously and have acted to, to address those recommendations. We have also recently adopted a chemical disclosure rule. Um, and here is where I wanted to talk about frac, frac Focus recently. Frac Focus is another example of what the states are accomplishing by working together and with the stakeholders to address uh, the issues that have arisen. Frac Focus was put together on, very short, um, or, uh, on a very short time frame uh, by the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, two organizations that represent the oil and gas producing states, um, as well as uh, the Groundwater Protection Council includes uh, the drinking water program administrators as well. Uh, since that um, system went into effect last April, April of 2011, over 18,000 wells have, uh, have been posted to that site with full information about the chemical constituents of the frac fluids. Uh, the uh, new rule in Oklahoma uh, is similar to rules that have been adopted in six or seven other states. Um, will, the rule will require the posting of the chemical information on hydraulic fracturing operations in Oklahoma to the Frac Focus website. We are trying to make sure that that information is available to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. McKee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. appreciate the opportunity of being able to take a couple min minutes on this. Uh, my name is Michael McKee. I'm a county commissioner in Uinta County, Utah. My primary focus as a county commissioner over the years has been relating to public lands issues and the natural resources, uh, specifically the extractive industry and our natural resource development. In Uinta County today, we have approximately 6,000 active oil and gas wells. Approximately 65 percent of the natural gas produced in the state of Utah comes from the area that I live out there in Uinta County. Um, the industry has provided many families with very good jobs, uh, above average uh, paying salaries. It is a, it's a way of life because 50 percent of the jobs, 60 percent of the economy in our area does come from the extractive industry. I am concerned about overregulation. I'm concerned about the stifling effect that overreach has on, on investment and, ec and economy. In regards to the new fracking proposed rules, I'm concerned that the Federal Government is trying to fix something that is not broke. It isn't even limping. In my 10 years of being a county commissioner, I have never heard of one valid violation or concern with hydraulic fracturing. This includes the fluids used, the depth, the method of injection, or any other concern being associated with fracturing. We just do not have that problem. Fracturing, hydraulic fracturing, is not a new technology, but a process that has been responsibly used for over 60 years. Hydraulic fracturing is a safe, well-tested technology that has enabled the U.S. to develop unconventional natural gas and increase reserves to over a 100-year supply. Fracturing has been performed in over 1 million wells with an exemplary safety record. 90 percent of the wells utilize hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic drilling and fracturing allows operators to, operators to produce 10 times the amount of energy 
by drilling fewer than one-tenth the number of wells. We are delivering cleaner burning domestic energy and more of it while drilling fewer holes to get to it. Regulatory decisions such as hydraulic fracturing are best made at the state level and not regulated by a federal bureaucracy far removed from the issue. This is why individual states can better tailor to their specific needs since they have the experience and understanding of the geology, hydrology, infrastructure, and other factors unique to each producing basin. State reg regulators understand the needs of the communities that they regulate much better than a far removed federal government and also have the specific technical expertise, resources, and experience. On March 14, 2012, now former BLM Director Bob Abbey testified in the Senate that there has been a shift in oil and gas production to private lands to the east and to the south where there is a lesser amount of Federal mineral estate. We have seen investment from public lands to other areas. Of course, uh, fracturing is, is, is because this is part of the concern we have is this uh, shift of investment can happen from this. Only 15 percent of my county is privately owned. These decisions can have a tremendous effect on the entire West where we have vast holdings of public lands. Adding additional burdens to, to development on Federal lands could have an adverse effect of forcing operators to shift investment away from my state and public land areas, thus depriving our citizens of needed jobs and income. The natural gas industry employs over 600,000 people in the United States. According to API, it accounts for nearly 4 million jobs and adds more than $385 billion to the national economy. Oil and gas royalties on public lands are a significant revenue source for the Federal Government, the State of Utah, and to the counties from where it comes. In 2008, there were over $200 million of mineral lease money collected from my county alone. Shell gas uh, and hydraulic fracturing has single-handedly turned the United States from a nation of declining gas production to one of rising production. If I could just uh, let me add just one, and I will conclude with this. Uh, I was approached by uh, tribal attorneys, and this is uh, an issue that they have as well. The oil and gas producing Indian tribes are very much against the BLM's proposed rule. As some members of this subcommittee may be aware, a large portion of the UN and RA reservation of the U Indian tribe rests within, rests within the boundaries of Uinta County in Utah. The Ute Indian tribe is one of the nation's largest oil and gas natural gas producing Indian tribes. The BLM's proposed rule would severely impact the development of tribal minerals in Uinta County. Yet despite this fact, the BLM has failed to comply with its legal obligation and duty to consult with impacted Indian tribes. BLM's proposed rule will kill tribal jobs in the oil and gas industry. The BLM has failed to work with the Ute Indian tribe regarding the proposed rule. In summary, local governments, many, many mineral producing states and affected Indian tribes are all very concerned with this, with this very ill-advised, unneeded, and redundant rule. And I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I would forward to this. I would like to enter into the record right now the ask unanimous consent. This is a letter from the National Congress of American Indians outlining some of the things that you just said there. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I would, uh, without objecting, I would ask for similar cur courtesy. I ask that at this time a uh, response uh, to Mr. Cranser's testimony this morning from our colleague, Mr. Waxman, uh, be entered into the record. I also ask that a similar response rebutting Mr. Krantzer's characterization of Dr. Howard's research from the Sierra Club, which Mr. Krantzer cited this morning, also be entered into the record at this time. Without objection. I thank the Chair. Mr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Robert Howarth. I have been a tenured member of the faculty at Cornell University since 1985. I'm here today as an individual. I do not represent the university, although the opinions I express are informed by my research conducted at Cornell. I've worked on the environmental risk assessment and consequences of environmental pollution, including the effects of oil and gas development since the mid-1970s. I was invited today to present information on the environmental and public health consequences of hydraulic fracturing, and I'll try to very briefly do so. Hydraulic fracturing is not new, as we've just heard. The process has existed for decades, but it's existed at a small scale, using very small volumes of water. 
What is new is the combination of high precision directional drilling with high volume hydraulic fracturing. The new combination uses 50 to 100 times more water than was ever used in fracturing until a decade or so ago, uh, 5 million gallons or so per well. And this new technology has indeed opened up new resources from shale gas and other unconventional gas. The technology is very, very new. I want to stress that. And as a result, the science, our understanding of what the consequences are, is also very, very new. For context, half of all of the shale gas that's ever been developed in the world has been produced in the last three years. So new technology, the science is new. In terms of peer-reviewed literature on what the environmental consequences are, it's almost all in the last year. The very first papers were published 14 months ago. So the science is new. It's very rapidly changing. I'll try to give you a, a, a sense of that today. One issue is surface water pollution. Very briefly, I want to say that there's good evidence that hydraulic fracturing in this new form has contaminated surface waters. Uh, one of the major ways is through improper waste disposal through sewage treatment plants. The City of Pittsburgh had a serious water quality problem from that with bromides entering into their system. Uh, it's now outlawed in Pennsylvania, but it's not outlawed in some other states. We still don't really have good alternatives for disposing of the hydraulic waste in much of the, of the country. Groundwater contamination appears to be a big issue. The science behind that is, is very uh, uh, iffy at the moment. A lot of the information is not publicly available, making the science difficult. Uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is undertaking a, a long, detailed study on that, and I think uh, most scientists would say we should hold off and see what they come up with. But there's certainly anecdotal evidence of a problem, and I could talk more about that uh, in questions if people would like. It's excellent evidence, evidence of methane contamination from hydraulic fracturing in wells, well documented in Pennsylvania. Local air pollution is an issue, and there are two that I will point to. One is benzene, which is emitted to the atmosphere routinely from hydraulic fracturing, and the State of Texas routinely reports values that are hazardous, sometimes at near acutely lethal uh, doses. Pennsylvania reports much lower concentrations so far, but they are concentrations which, in my opinion, pose a significant cancer risk from chronic exposure. We have a big problem from ozone pollution, from hydraulic fracturing. The methane and other hydrocarbons that are released to the atmosphere uh, make ground level ozone pollution. We are seeing large amounts of ozone pollution in uh, western states where it has almost never been seen as a problem before. So that, say, in the winter in Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, the ozone concentrations are now higher than they are in Los Angeles or New York City. And this is undoubtedly a direct relation to hydraulic fracturing. My own research has been on the role of, of methane release from shale gas and how that affects the greenhouse gas footprint. We published the very, very first analysis of that uh, 13 and a half months ago. Our conclusion was that because methane is 105-fold more powerful as a greenhouse gas, over the time period of 20 years after emission, that methane leakage, even at small rates, is a serious greenhouse gas concern, giving shale gas a larger greenhouse gas footprint than, than other fossil fuels. I will come back to that in just a minute. I want to briefly mention one other issue, and that is radon in gas supplies. Radon is a gas. It is carcinogenic. It is the major exposure of ionizing radiation to the public in the United States currently. Natural gas is already a major route of exposure to getting radon into the homes. And shale gas, at least from the Marcellus shale, is far, far richer in radon than conventional natural gas has been. So this is something I think deserves a lot more attention and scrutiny, a lot more study. In my opinion, it poses a significant public health risk that has gone underappreciated so far. I believe the Federal agencies have a, a central role in regulating oil and gas development generally, but also particularly with the development of this unconventional oil and gas by high volume hydraulic fracturing. The issues involved are complex, they are new, the technologies are new, they are continually evolving, and the scientific is issues are difficult. And from my experience with interacting with agency scientists and managers in many states and in many, many Federal agencies over the last 35 years, I believe most states lack the technical expertise to, to deal with these complex issues. Finally, I would note that the 
pollution from unconventional oil and gas in water and in air and in pipelines moves across state lines, and so there is clearly a role for Federal involvement. I would like to take just a final uh, minute, if I could, uh, to, to, to briefly respond to the written testimony of my uh, fellow witness here to the left, Mr. Krantzer. In the written testimony I have heard of, uh, he is very critical of our work on greenhouse gas, so I would like to uh, set the record straight on that. Uh, I have written an addendum uh, to my testimony to do so. I would also like to ask the committee to take into formal uh, part of the record this paper, Methane Emissions from Natural Gas Systems, which I and many other co-authors wrote for the U.S. National Climate Assessment at the request of the Office of Science and Technology Policy Assessment in February, in which our work is explicitly compared with all other studies that have ever been done on this topic. Yeah, without objection, we accept that in the record. Thank you. The bottom line is that our estimates of methane emissions were the first. There have been many estimates since then. One of the things we called for was further direct study. Most of the information is available only from industry sources. It is poorly documented. We called for direct independent studies that are starting to happen. The first one is now being published by NOAA and University of Colorado scientists. And what it shows is that we are conservative and low. The methane emissions are worse than we said. I would be happy to go into more detail on that work if the committee is interested, but my time is over. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you. Mr. Krantzer. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm not sure when the last time Washington, D.C. saw a duel out in front of the uh, congressional uh, uh, offices, but me and uh, my good colleague now, Bob Haworth, might have to have one after this. Uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, we in Pennsylvania have a comprehensive program to regulate what is not a new activity in Pennsylvania. That is oil and gas exploration and hydraulic fracturing. We have been doing it for about 60 years. And each state is different. That is the key. Pennsylvania is not the same as Oklahoma. It is not the same as Texas. It is not even the same as New York, necessarily. Uh, we have um, uh, regulations regarding well casing and cement for the drilling process. We have regulation for water handling and surface water. We have regulations for air impact. We are doing short-term air impact studies. We are going to do long-term impact uh, studies. And one of the things that was just mentioned uh, by Professor Howarth, the uh, sewage treatment plants in Pittsburgh, uh, he did say it is now outlawed in Pennsylvania. Well, that is proof in the pudding that, of course, the states are very capable, agile, and uh, uh, know enough about what is going on in their backyard to take uh, the appropriate steps. Um, uh, my colleague at the end, Ms. Wartenberry, testified about Stronger. Stronger did review Pennsylvania's regulations in 2010. And uh, th those uh, regulations uh, were reviewed very well by Stronger. Uh, just recently, SUNY Buffalo in this uh, May issued a report that, uh, in essence, followed up on that, that brought it current. And that report concluded that there was a compelling case that Pennsylvania's oversight of oil and gas regulation uh, has been effective. Uh, we have a brand new statute in Pennsylvania, again, proving the agility of the state to act and our knowledge of our own state, Act 13, which uh, brought on uh, some new requirements regarding setbacks regarding disclosure, and we have one of the most forward-thinking advanced disclosure uh, provisions of any state in the union, and for the first time ever requiring disclosure to uh, medical professionals. Um, and uh, I heard what Professor Howarth said about the methane study and his methane study and his criticism of my criticism of it, but I just have to note that um, I will have to take a number and get in line for the folks that are critiquing Professor Howarth's report, and that is part of the academic process, and that is all fair, and that is uh, what we should be doing. Um, I, I do have to take some exception to some of the uh, points. Um, atmospheric benzene levels near, quote, some drilling sites. Well, uh, what drilling sites? They are not mentioned in his testimony, and, and I am not sure what he is talking about with, return, with respect to chronic uh, exposure and, and so forth. That is a toxicologist's and epidemiologist's uh, uh, purview. Um, the, the report that there have been several uh, reported contamination of drinking water wells and surface aquifers by frac fluids in Pennsylvania is just not true. Uh, that, that is simply not true. Not even Duke, who I've also had issues with the uh, study from Duke, not even the Duke study drew a connection between any frac fluids being in the water in Pennsylvania. And methane migration, let me remind everybody, methane migration has been a, 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 a creature in Pennsylvania for generations, and it has probably been a creature in other states as well. Any drilling, if it is not done right, can cause 
contamination or can cause methane migration. That is why in Pennsylvania we have our well casing and cementing regulations that we put into place because we knew what our geology was like and we knew uh, what was necessary uh, on, the, on the floor. And, and, I, and I would agree with what Professor Howar says, that the, the, this area is complex, it is evolving, it is difficult, but that is actually a reason the States should be on top of regulating. The States know how to react to these things. It is a proven record in Pennsylvania. We, it, we know the science in the States. We are not idiots in the States compared to the Federal Government, for example, who knows everything. That is not the way it works. And I would take a little bit of a, a discussion point with the uh, ranking member. The, the way environmental regulation works in this country is primarily based on State delegation, State running with the ball to regulate environmental matters. And in terms of hydro hydraulic fracturing, I talk about it in my testimony, the history is clear. The Federal Government has never indicated an interest, any administration, any Congress, any EPA, in regulating hydraulic fracturing until all of a sudden now there is a huge interest to get into it from various different, uh, various different aspects. And that is all borne out in the history of the Safe Drinking Water Act. That is all borne out in the bipartisan 2005 Energy Policy Act, which did nothing more than uh, restate what the longstanding policy had been with respect to uh, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act's uh, non-regulation of fracking. So with that, I will conclude and, and look forward to uh, questions and some more discussion. Thank you for that. I yield to myself for just a moment. I want to bring a quick prop. This is shale rock. And for those of you that are state regulators, you are very, very aware of it. But sometimes we lose track of the fact. When we are talking about pulling out oil and natural gas out of the ground, many people are used to conventional wells where there is a pocket of oil or a pocket of gas there. The, the, the gas or the oil is not around this. It is inside of this. And how it gets pulled out in this process is, tech, is technology that is impressive in the way that it is done. To drill down, to put a well a mile deep, sometimes two miles long than underground, through this rock, just like this, solid rock, to frack it with water and with some propants, and then to pull out of this oil or gas is revolutionary. This is why we have such a tremendous supply that is coming online, is because now we are actually pulling energy out of rocks, not out of a pool, not around this, from this. So it is somewhat a revolution, I understand that. But it is not new in just the past couple of years. As Mr. Kranzer mentioned as well, in 2005, Congress was very specific on this, that EPA had regulatory oversight over it only if it had diesel fuels in the fracking fluid but to leave that back up to the States as well. My question is for any of you, why has this become such an issue dealing with fracking right now? In the last couple of years, why has there been such a rise in so many areas about fracking? And I know this is just going to be an opinion guess for you. Mr. Howarth, we will have to make responses short because we will have short on time. As I stressed in my testimony, the ability to get that uh, fantastic resource out of the shale, you are right, it is incredible technology, but it is new technology. So it was developed first in, in Texas, somewhat in Oklahoma, in the south, uh, areas which uh, are very different than what is going on now. Right, I understand. In the so right now, there has been an incredible shift on it. This has been known, though, for several years, as I mentioned, in 2005 legislation on it. Why but, right now has there been such a rush to it? Has there been, has there been some new breakthrough because the EPA administrator has told us repeatedly that they have not found from EPA a single site of groundwater contamination from hydraulic fracking. I believe what EPA probably told you was that they are not aware of a single case where the action of the fracking itself led to water contamination. There are multiple publicly known cases where there is water contamination associated with the development of shale gas or other tight sand You're gas. You are talking about from the surface. Uh, no, in, including from, from wells. There is a, a, a documented uh, incidence of at least 1 percent, well, perhaps up to 6 percent of well failures. Here is here, what I know typically, and, and there have been some very, very public cases of this from EPA in the past year and a half, where EPA comes out and says, we have got a major problem, we have got to take over in this area. They begin testing all those wells, and then it comes back later, oh, that was just methane that is naturally occurring that is migrating into an area. That is a chemical that was already present there. Most recently, on May the 11th of this year, in Denmark, Pennsylvania, EPA quietly released what was initially a panic to say that frac fluids have caused all this, that they have come back now and said, 
we were wrong. Uh, that was not a source of that. So th there has been quite a shift that has occurred here. Let me, let me just move on to a couple other areas as well. If, if I could just make one, one case. The, the methane contamination is clearly a result of the hydraulic fracturing of these shales. The study from Duke University published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences right. is e unambiguous. Okay. Well, we'll have to, if you can pull some of that for us, and we would be glad to be able to receive that as well. But uh, EPA has disagreed on several of those. Uh, and methane, obviously, is a naturally occurring substance that does move uh, in the ground and does release as well on that. Let, uh, Mr. Krenzer, well, I would like Ms. Roddenberry to say the same thing on this as well, or Mr. McKee as well. Let, let Geology the same in Utah, in Pennsylvania, in Oklahoma, same rock, same depth of water, same soils. Are things the same in all three of your states underground? No, absolutely not. They are not the same geologically, topographically, meteorologi meteorologically, weather, um, or, or on the surface. On the Duke study, I take issue with uh, Professor Haworth again. The Duke study was uh, very limited. Um, and uh, other studies have come out, including one from the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, which uh, seemed to lead to uh, another conclusion. And in, in your more fundamental question, why all this attention, I would refer to you, and I am not going to go through it, but there was a great article about this called Everything You Have Heard About Fossil Fuels May Be Wrong. It is by Michael Lind. It is in the New America Foundation. And it is all about what he thinks, uh, why all this attention has grown. And it is because natural gas which used to be viewed as maybe a bridge fuel, a fossil fuel that the people who don't like fossil fuel could hold their nose and get through, it is now could be the fuel of the century. And that has caused some cognitive dissonance among some uh, significant interest groups, ergo the pushback. Right. Mr. McKee, let me make one statement to you. You mentioned in your testimony that you have seen and there is a perception that there is a shift of investment out of the West to the East, and I assume you mean out of BLM lands and that there is a fear that you have that you are about to lose the potential of getting energy. Is it because you are running out of energy underground in your area, or what would be the reason that you, you, there is this sense of investment is moving away from your area? I have to get your microphone there. Um, first of all, there is a tremendous resource of energy in, in our area. As I mentioned, there is 111 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. There is an immense amount of oil, oil, shale, all these different resources. And so it is not because of lack of opportunity. In fact, there is enough to, to help us with great energy independence. But public policy definitely uh, makes these changes. And we have seen investment shift just because of, of public policy. When you say public policy, what do you mean? Well, uh, BLM policy having to do the way that they, with leases, uh, you know, those different types of policies that come out of uh, Bureau of Land Management. This is just another example. And when it becomes much easier to invest on private lands compared to public lands. In my county, as I, I may have mentioned, only 15 percent of my county is privately held. In the West, much of our land is public lands. And so if we take that opportunity off the table, what are we doing to the national security and, and the opportunities of, of energy independence when we have unneeded, redundant policies? And, and then to more of the specific question, uh, at least out in our area, most of our wells are at least a mile deep. Some of them will go a couple miles deep. And, uh, you know, we are not dealing with shale gas. That, and that is why, again, I think it is valuable that these decisions are made on State levels, because when you have a one-size shoe-fit-all type of regulation, and I will tell you, I visited with consultants, and some of the proposed rules make absolutely no sense at all. There is not time for that here today. But the States best handle these kind of uh, policies. Thank you. Let me recognize the ranking member. I would also recognize him for an additional two minutes beyond his normal questioning time. You are very gracious, and I thank the Chair. Um, and welcome to our panel. Uh, Mr. Cranser, um, I unfortunately had to be at a funeral this morning <clears throat> of a close friend, and I did not hear your testimony, and, and I had it described to me. Um, but if I understood correctly, your testimony uh, in essence says, based on your experience in Pennsylvania, you believe the other 49 states can also live uh, with pure state regulation. We don't need federal regulation in this particular uh, enterprise. Is that an accurate characterization of your testimony? I'm sorry. That's probably uh, based on my experience in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is very well able right. to regulate fracking. Based on my experience with the Environmental Council of the States, my experience with other uh, colleagues of mine in other states that do this work. Uh, I'm convinced that they can do it in their states. It's not done in every state. And right. based on the experience of Stronger, that's why we have groups like Stronger that 
that but, uh, help us do this as states. But let me just ask, based on what I just heard you testify, it sounds like uh, Pennsylvania has a robust regulatory framework. You, you cited, for example, chemical disclosure laws that you have to enforce, uh, and you feel it works very well in Pennsylvania. Is that not correct? That is correct, and I invite you to come visit Pennsylvania, and I can show you firsthand how it works. I can take it to a well site. Be glad to do it. I, I, I went to high school in Pennsylvania. I got married in Pennsylvania. I have a lot of ties to Pennsylvania. I would be glad to do it. Um, but let me ask, um, does your expertise extend to the other 49 states, though? Surely you are not in a position, or are you, to testify that you are satisfied based on empirical evidence that the other 49 states are as robust and as diligent as Pennsylvania? Well, I mean, that question uh, is, uh, I don't know how to respond to it, because it is not a 49, other 49 state issues. Other states, many other states do not do fracking at all. The ones that do do it have a track record that indicate they can do it, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, West Virginia, Ohio, et cetera. But you know what? Even if they don't have an existing program now, they as states, and I can say this as my experience as a state regulator, are in the best position to know their states, know what to do, and get the, the uh, regulatory plan uh, that they need in their state. But, but you would concede, at least as an intellectual conceit, that there could be a state where fracturing is, in fact, occurring uh, that is not as robust and diligent as Pennsylvania. Well, I mean, I could concede also that Sasquatch is in the woods, but that doesn't get us anywhere. The, and, the and discussion and, today and is Mr. whether Mr. the states Mr. are doing is, a good this job. This is my time. And the point is you don't have expertise. With, the other, with respect to the other states, you do with Pennsylvania. That is a red herring because you don't either. Mr. Uh, I mean, Mr. the bottom Cranzer, line is. Mr. Cranzer, the, the issue here is whether or not the Federal Government has a role. You testified you think it should not have a role. No, I don't think the issue is whether the Federal Government necessarily has a role. The issue is whether the Federal Government should have a preemptive role or why wouldn't it have or shouldn't it have a preemptive role. I am here to say it should not have a preemptive role. It certainly should have a role in which we discuss things together. I often communicate with my counterpart at Region 3, and I am sure my other counterparts do that as well. The question on the table is the fundamental one, Ranking Member, who is in the better place? Are you in the better place in Washington to tell Oklahoma what to do? Are you in the better place to Washington, in Washington to tell us in Pennsylvania what to do? The bottom line thank you, Mr. is Cranzer. no. You're t Mr. Cranzer, thank you. Um, yeah. And I would simply say those are the same kinds of arguments that have been used for generations against Federal involvement. Um, if we were talking 40, 50 years ago about, for example, Jim Crow laws in the South and the Civil Rights Movement, we would have heard testimony right here at this table. With all due respect, no, Mr. Cranzer, it's now my time. Mr. Chairman, I insist that committee rules be adhered to. This is my time. And, Mr. Cranzer, I gave you the benefit of the doubt and allowed you to answer as you wished. It's now my time. And I believe that that philosophy is an error. I don't share it. Well, that I, philosophy I, was Cranzer, enacted in 2005. Mr. Chairman, I insist Mr. on regular Cranzer. order. Yeah, Mr. Cranzer, allow the member to speak. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but I, I believe that the philosophy that there is no role for the Federal Government or there ought to never be any preemptive role for the Federal Government has been proved false by history. And that is clearly what this hearing is designed to do, as was the hearing this morning. I don't share the philosophy. And the fact that you have had a good experience in Pennsylvania, I don't believe can extra be necessarily extrapolated to the rest of the country. And as you have indicated, you don't have the expertise, actually, to say here at this table under oath that uh, you are satisfied, based on empirical evidence, that all of the other states uh, that are involved uh, have similar robust regimes, uh, regulatory regimes. Dr. Howarth, um, you, uh, you talked about methane. Uh, help us understand why, why sh what is wrong with methane. Cows exist, uh, uh, exhibit methane. Methane comes from lots, lots of sources, but the single largest source of methane to the atmosphere of the United States from human sources is the natural gas industry. At least 39, 40 percent or more of methane pollution comes from the But so what? Why, why should we be Why do we care? Well, it is an incredibly powerful uh, greenhouse gas. It, it's a uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of trying to start to address global warming. If we get methane under control, we are far better along than, than uh, CO2. I can go into more detail on that. 
It also is a major contributor to ground-level ozone. I mentioned that briefly in my, my statement. I should point out that ground-level ozone already causes 30,000 premature deaths in the United States every year. So methane in and of itself is not a danger except for the global warming part of it. Yeah, methane is not but, toxic. But, but it helps create increased levels of ozone? It, it leads definitely to increased levels of ozone. And ozone is ozone, a danger to human health. And it, its release is carrying along other things, such as benzene, which is also a contributor. It, to, is ozone regulated by the EPA? Oh, ozone definitely is regulated. Ground level ozone, for Ground example? Ground level ozone is regulated by the EPA. Right here in the National Capital Region, I seem to recall that we are subject to because we are a non-attainment area, serious uh, EPA regulation with respect to ground level ozone. Is that, that correct? That, that's correct. So that might be a concern. Uh, I am running out of time, but one, one of the other concerns that has come up, help us understand it, the science of it a little bit, what about reports of seismic events associated with the return, I guess, of effluent, uh, fracking effluent? Yep, absolutely. There has uh, been an increase in, in earthquakes, relatively small earthquakes, but still a large number of small earthquakes in several places, Ohio, Oklahoma, elsewhere. The U.S. Geological Survey, after a thorough study, has attributed this to uh, disposal of frac return waste into ground disposal wells that uh, has changed the uh, geology in such a way as to increase that earthquake risk, and they have seen the increase. I should point out that the industry is moving more towards getting oil rather than gas out of shale because of the market considerations at the moment, the relative prices of the two. And the largest oil reserves in shale in the United States are in the Central Valley of California and in the Los Angeles Basin. And there, the earthquake concerns with disposal of frac waste should give everyone pause. I thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your graciousness. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And I thank all of you for being on the panel today. And we do have uh, great differences of opinion as to, as to where we are going with this. I, I, I guess, you know, when I am back home in western Pennsylvania, there is a great deal of concern about the Federal Government, again, getting involved in areas where those people in those states don't really think they should be. You know, just give me, I mean, why, why now? I mean, what, what's going on that all of a sudden the EPA has to get involved in fracking? This isn't new. It's 60 years old. It's been going on for a long time. And, and we're talking about eight times the Empire State Building, one on top of the other on top of the other. It's that far below the surface. So, I mean, this isn't right at the surface. And I, and I get a little bit concerned about that because we hear about all this new technology. And I know there's great innovation and uh, just the horizontal drilling. But if you could, uh, and Mr. Cranston, because you are from PA and, and we have talked before, wh wh why now? I mean, wh what is going on that is this public concern and what brought it about? Well, I, I think uh, it, it harkens back to the article uh, that I just mentioned that I would be happy to provide the committee. Um, and uh, also, I do believe, uh, and I think Madison wrote about this in the Federalist Papers, there is a tendency of, uh, of power to want more power. So that may be uh, part of what is going on here as well. Mr. Rottenberry. I believe, first of all, you have to keep in mind that some people are labeling hydraulic fracturing, uh, labeling all kinds of um, issues associated with oil and gas drilling and production as hydraulic fracturing. Um, there are certainly some issues associated with um, the rapid development of uh, oil and gas in areas where it has not occurred before. We have seen that um, happen in various parts of the country. It has happened in certain, certain areas of Oklahoma. But this public concern, I mean, this has been around for 60-some years. I mean, we never had this, this degree of concern before. And I, I know one of the studies is the Dimmick PA. Why, why Dimmick PA? I mean, there is a large swath of Marcellus Shale through Pennsylvania. So why, why Dimmick PA? Why this little town? And why not some of the other areas? Well, I, I can, if you are asking me, I could talk for an hour about Dimmick and I won't. Uh, the, the State had been um, taking care of issues in Dimmick from both an enforcement standpoint and a technical standpoint for a long time. All of a sudden, the EPA, for reasons I have no idea, uh, decided in January that they have to come in, I suppose as a big brother or as a white knight or whatever, to come in and do water testing and start supplying water to four families. And as Representative Langford correctly pointed out, and it was, it was interesting because the reports of no health impact would always come out on a Friday afternoon right. at about 4 o'clock, um, and then they, of course, would die in the press. But there have been four rounds of sampling and uh, four nothings. And actually, Representative Marino was very interested in that because even at mid-course, they had spent a million dollars already out of the Superfund response fund 
um, which uh, certainly could have gone a long way in northeastern Pennsylvania on a lot of Superfund response projects. And in that case, they, they tested 59 wells and found nothing that indicated that, that the fracturing, uh, fracking was causing any. Well, any more damage. than that, they found no health impacts whatsoever. Remember that when they came into Dimmick in the first place, they never made a connection between hydraulic fracturing and what, what it is they were looking for. And I asked them specifically, and they said, no, we don't have an enforcement connection here. Okay. So if, if Gasland doesn't come out, the movie doesn't come out, uh, I won't call it a documentary, uh, if the movie doesn't come out, Dimmick PA probably doesn't get on anybody's radar. Well, Dimmick was put on the radar, I believe, if I've got my uh, uh, movie history correctly right. by that, that okay. uh, film. All right. and, and I think that uh, all of us are concerned. You know, sound science, I'm, I'm totally in favor of. Political science, I, I, I wonder. Uh, because a lot of this is a result of, you know, if you don't succeed at first, try, try it again. Uh, I, I'm wondering where we're going with this and, and at what point, what point does the EPA walk away from this and say we don't need this? I know in Pennsylvania you've done a great job. I know in Oklahoma you've done a great job. And I think the question does come down, and always in this town we talk about it. One is it that the Federal Government gets out of the way and lets the States take care of themselves? Well, Representative, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I've never been uh, compared to Jim Crow or favor of Jim Crow for my views on Federal-State relationships. But let's remember that if you, the history is the Federal Government has never shown an interest, whether it's whatever administration, whatever Congress, whatever EPA, that's what the Safe Drinking Water Act was about. That's what the 2005 Energy Policy Act was about. And that was a bipartisan act in which Ken Salazar and the President of the United States, current President of the United States, voted for it. Yeah. And I, I would think that right now this great abundance uh, and uh, the accessibility and the affordability of natural gas has really had a great influence on a green agenda because this was supposed to be the bridge to get us there, and now we're finding out that instead of being the bridge, it's actually the bedrock of energy in this country. And it, it's, it puts us in a position uh, and you and I have talked earlier about this. I don't want to be in a fair fight with the rest of the world. And we have natural resources right here provided by God, and we're not taking advantage of them to put ourselves in the best position in the world economically. Why in the world would we continue to keep the government's boot on the throat of success and in, in the, the great opportunities and jobs for this country and the revenue that could be produced? I, uh, I know I'm out of time, but I want to thank you all for being here. I know it's frustrating, but uh, we'll keep working on it, and we'll try and get to the, the bottom of it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Prentfeld. Thank you very much. I, and I would like to start with, uh, and I would like to thank the panelists all for being here. I would like to start with Mrs., uh, or Ms. Wartenberry, since she is my neighbor uh, to the north in Oklahoma. I am from Texas. And um, ExxonMobil put together a little graphic that I, I wanted to share with you guys. This basically shows a drilling. And about 100 feet under, you will typically hit the groundwater. And uh, I realize you might have a little difficulty seeing that. And then to protect the groundwater, there are multiple layers of concrete and steel casing. And this is true in both conventional wells that go down and hit a pool of oil or, or gas or a reservoir of oil and gas, as well as uh, when hydraulic fracking is used. Is that an accurate statement? Yes. That, so there's the, basically the, generally, the way, yeah, yeah. well, the, the way the freshwater resources are protected. During, right. So, drilling in, well. in, a, in a case where there's hydraulic fracking as opposed to traditional, the, the, it's basically protected the same way. So, similar risks of, of uh, groundwater contamination uh, exist from how we've been producing oil and gas since the Civil War, basically. Yeah, we've, we've had um, obviously some technical improvements. We've had casing and cementing requirements for oil and gas wells for for many decades. They've actually evolved and improved over the years, um, but uh, a basic principle um, throughout right. throughout the history of regulation has been we 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 case the well through the freshwater zone to to isolate. All right, and water. so when you, when when you frack a well, you're you're, you're quite a bit below the water table. The water table is what, a couple hundred feet in Oklahoma? It, it varies. That's, that's one right. thing. The, the geology and the... And but I mean, you're, you're typically, you're, you're talking hundreds of feet, not thousands of feet. It, it can be, in, in a few isolated areas, it right. can be, be very deep. Yeah. Typically, though, you're right. It's so, so the local and, regulators have a, have a good and, understanding and of the And we have knowledge. that actually mapped. We have on, right. on our Internet uh, the maps that show the base of fresh water throughout the state of Oklahoma. And, and so when you're fracking, you're traditionally much, 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 much deeper. I mean, we're talking miles uh, in, 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 certainly in most Texas cases, it's at least a mile, sometimes two miles below 
the water table. So the, what, the, the chance of something migrating up through the rock going up two miles is, just defies common sense that that's, a, that, that's an issue. Let me go on to um, in, in, in visit with uh, Mr. McKee. Uh, Y'all are having most of your land. You've got to get BLM permits and all sorts of permits. You know, in Texas, we kind of fly through it in weeks, months, but certainly not uh, years in getting something permitted on uh, private land. Now, this is costing. I assume there's a cost associated with this, not just with jobs. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There was a study that we just released that shows that. Uh, the, uh, the investment on every well is about $6 million in Utah. And uh, so when we, you know, there's the mineral lease royalties, there's the jobs, there's the... And, and in, in, in when land is leased from the federal government, you pay a, a bonus to, uh, to get the lease. You buy the lease. Yes, that's correct. And then there's from, a... from everything that's produced, the federal government gets a royalty. So we get a percentage of all the oil and of, of the money all that oil and gas is so forth that we could use to pay for roads and highways that we can bring into the federal budget to help balance the budget. So it's a source of income we are losing uh, as a federal government. Absolutely. Let me give just one example. Recently, six leases were reinstated. I believe it was about 6,000 acres. The right to lease on those lands was, it cost the, the bidders $48.6 million just for those 6,000 acres, just for the right to drill. And then there's a 12.5 percent royalty that comes into the federal government that's, there's a sharing formula with the states. But, uh, you know, that's a tremendous source of, of revenue. I indicated there were over $200 million of, of federal uh, mineral lease royalties coming out of my county. Well, I, you know, I also sit on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and one of the ways we're looking to pay for maintaining our deteriorating infrastructure of roads, bridges, the interstate highway system is using that royalty money. So those delays are costing the American people uh, in not just dollars and cents, but in much needed repairs and, and even the safety of our highway system. Absolutely. And uh, let me uh, go on to uh, Mr. Krantzer. Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the statement of the former Region 6 EPA Director Al Armendariz when he says it was the EPA's uh, goal to, or he wanted to crucify the oil and gas industry? Do you see that as uh, actually happening? You don't really want to lead me into that discussion, do you? <laughs> I, I'm from I, Texas. He was our EPA guy. I actually I met Al once, and I've, I only know what I've read in the papers. Okay, um, but, but you, do you, do you feel like the EPA is is targeting? Do you have a feeling that they're targeting the oil and gas industry unfairly? Well, I, I try to keep my eye on my own uh, court and uh, what we're doing. I, I do see permit uh, delays and permit lags. I talked this morning about the rocket docket for. Um, uh, regulations, uh, historic regulations in air and NACs and so forth compared to the, to the snail docket for getting permits done. Yep. Well, I see I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, panel. Thank you. We're going to do just a couple minutes of, of questioning here just to do some follow-up on it. For the th three State regulators, I just need some clarification on this, and this is just a process question. Uh, new guidance has been released by EPA dealing with the diesel fuels. Uh, issue in EPA's involvement. Obviously, there has been traditional primacy uh, in the oversight uh, process for fracking in states. Uh, what I am interested in is for you on, on how, how you are interpreting that, how that is working through the process of that guidance dealing with diesel fuels and fracking and expanding the definition of diesel fuels. Does that make sense? So just, I, I know this is, a, a, this is in process, uh, but just how is that going? What are you, what are you doing with that? It is in process. We are reviewing the document. I will say it does not uh, directly apply to the State of Oklahoma because we administer the UIC program for oil and gas operations under Section 1425 of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and so we have a, a little bit different framework. But we are looking at it closely because there is no doubt that uh, EPA will be coming to visit with us about how we address the various elements that are in that guidance. So, there are some key issues in there that uh, concern us. We are putting our comments together and we will be submitting those. Is it your assumption that guidance will become a rule? Or is it your assumption this is just an opinion piece that will probably affect BLM areas but won't affect private areas? We are concerned that EPA will implement it as if it were a rule. Okay. Rule or not that they apply it the same? Yes. Okay. Mr. Krantzer. 
I am sorry. Were you talking about the BLM rule or the diesel fracking permitting guidance? Di or both? Diesel fracking. Diesel, the diesel fracking. fracking permitting. Well, let, let me say first that uh, I don't believe that is going to be an issue in Pennsylvania. Um, there is no information that we have that diesel fuel is being used uh, for fracking. I don't know whether that is going to be an issue in other right. states. EPA does have primacy of the uh, UIC program in Pennsylvania, and that is because we just don't do a lot of UIC disposal. But I think you have hit the nail on the head. We have to keep an eye, and the country does, on how well, that diesel fuel e definition. EPA is currently in the process of trying to redefine what is a diesel fuel. That, that, and that, that's that was my question to you. I know that, that conversation is ongoing. How are you processing that with EPA at this point? Uh, we are watching it very carefully, because it is the uh, proverbial, I hate to use a cliche, nose in the camel's tent. Uh, this, the 2005 uh, Energy Policy Act did exclude fracking with diesel fuel. We all know that. Uh, but if you define diesel fuel to be everything, then uh, you have probably gone beyond what the law intended and you have probably acted illegally to boot. Okay. Thank you. And one, one quick last question. Uh, Ms. Rodenberry, uh, the comment was made earlier about earthquakes in Oklahoma based on fracking uh, and a direct tie on that. Are you aware of earthquakes in Oklahoma based on the fracking itself? We are working with uh, seismologists at the University of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Geological Survey to, to study um, the possible connection uh, between uh, earthquakes and various types of oil and gas operations. Any, any statements that have been made that there has been some kind of conclusive uh, link uh, are premature. Right. Um, are earthquakes in Oklahoma common, small earthquakes? Yes. We, we live in a seismically active area, and, and the, the records show that. Okay. Thank you. That I yield to the uh, ranking member for three minutes as well. I thank the chair. Um, uh, Mr. McKee, uh, like you, I come from local government. I was the chairman of my um, county. Uh, before I came here. Um, so I appreciate your service. Um, I think local government is very important. Um, you, did I understand your testimony to mean that you, you felt that excessive Federal regulation, BLM regulation, inter alia, um, had, uh, had served as uh, an impediment to job creation in your community? That is, <clears throat> that is correct. What is the unemployment rate? In, and, and am I pronouncing your county right? Uinta? Uinta. Uinta. Uinta, excuse me. Yeah. What is the unemployment rate in Uinta? Today it is only about 4 percent. However, um, when the downturn in the economy happened, uh, because we are an extractive community, we didn't know that there was even a recession going on as far as what we were feeling until we had new policies that came in. And almost overnight, uh, we lost uh, a number of jobs because of, of new policies that but at 4.1 percent, which is pretty low. Which is today, yes. Pardon me? Yeah, today it's, it's good, 4 percent. 4 percent. How does that rank with other counties in Utah? Yeah, we're among the best as, as far as. Uh, Might it be, in fact, the lowest rate in Utah? Uh, I, I'd have to double check that. I'm not sure, but I know we're, we're pretty good because of our oil and gas economy. What, what percentage of your county is federal, federally owned or controlled land? Uh, <clears throat> I know we're only 15 percent privately held. I believe it's about 59 percent that's BLM, and there's some forest. I think 17 and a half percent with the tribe, and a little bit of state institutional trust lands properties. Do you have any idea on that federal land how many leases have in fact been or permits have been granted but not utilized? I know that there's a, a fairly strong backlog on the permitting process today. I believe I was told there's over 1,000 permits that are in backlog that they have not been able to, to issue because of the backlog issue. Mm. So, but in some cases, it's also a utilization issue, isn't it, that some have, in fact, been granted and not used? Uh, what I am told is there's, uh, it's, it's many times, it's very difficult because sometimes these permits show up in a category as though they have been issued, but they are still waiting for uh, the government to, to finalize what they are what they're doing, final. so they get held up. Um, we're, obviously, one of the things we have been talking about today is air pollution, Yes, whether it can be attributed to fracturing or whatever. Your, yours is largely a rural county, is it not? It is. One would normally expect in a rural county relatively clean air. How does Uinta County stack up in that regard? Uh, we do have um, 
<clears throat> Overall, our, our air quality is good with the exception of winter ozone. We do have a winter ozone issue, and I would like to, if I could just touch on that one quick moment that I would, Certainly. if I could disagree a little bit with my colleague to the left here. Uh, he had indicated that fracturing was causing, you know, the, the use of hydraulic fracturing was causing the winter ozone issue. I have personally uh, been very involved with this issue, meeting with the uh, state to, and, and even in the EPA offices in Denver. And as we have had roundtable discussions, extensive studies going on, I have never yet heard to this day any tie to hydraulic fracturing. There to, may, to what, Mr. I know my time is running out, uh, but I, I was stunned to learn that you actually top Los Angeles um, on, on a number of occasions at 149 parts per billion with respect to uh, ozone. In fact, the EPA called it unearthly at some points. What is the cause of such high ozone layer, uh, 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 levels in uh, Uinta County? You know, this, this study is going on. It appears, and this is what I was referring to a moment ago, this is tied, uh, it appears to be, you know, a number of factors that the scientists are still trying to learn about. But one of the things that they recognize is it is tied with sunlight and snow. This past winter, we did not have very much snow on the ground. We did not have uh, any exceedances. In fact, we were well below the, the number. A year ago, we had deep snow, and uh, the numbers were fairly high. And so the scientists are, the jury is still out, and that is what they are trying to, to find learn. Out. I thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will now take a short recess to prepare for the second panel. Panelists, thank you very much for being here and staying through two rounds of questioning on that. I appreciate the time very much.